All right, so I've got some news articles up here. So Twitter just declared that they're going to remove all political ads from the platform, which sounds like a very simple, brilliant way to solve the problem of deceptive political ads. And uh, people wondered if Facebook is going to follow suit. And Mark Zuckerberg has come out and said, absolutely not. During the earnings call where he announced record earnings, he said, even though Twitter is not going to carry political ads, Facebook is going to continue to carry them. And as usual, he has a justification that just seems like random words and makes no sense. He says that it's the only political ads is only 0.5% of their income and it's far more trouble than it's worth. And he absolutely refuses to stop doing it. So that's what you usually get out of Zuckerberg is just sort of random nonsense. He'd probably make a good president. Anyway, so, um, anyway, um, so Uber and Linda got hacked and they're talking about how they did it here. These guys hacked in and, and tried to get extortion out of them and they, um, they tracked them down. And this was the famous case at the time because Linda had a breach and disclosed it the usual way, but Uber decided not to disclose the breach. And after they got hacked, they contacted the hackers and said, we're going to call this a bug bounty and pay the $100,000 ransom. And then we're going to track down your real location and make you sign a non-disclosure agreement and therefore try to claim to regula regulators that that was not a breach. And ultimately, they had to uh, knock that off and admit that it was a breach and so on. But it was an interesting way to try to dodge disclosure regulations at the time. The typical uh, sleazy stuff that Uber did all the time. This is very interesting. They've been tracking down Russia's disinformation tactics in Africa. They've tracked down how they're doing it. They are refining their disinformation techniques. And they're going to bring them to America after that, presumably. And so by studying what they're doing in Africa, we can help um, be aware of what's going to happen in America for the people in America who are actually interested in stopping them which is not most of the government. Most of the government is uh, pretty much blocked from stopping Russian attacks under the Trump administration, but some people do want to measure it and stop it. And so they're talking about how they do it. They um, compromise or buy accounts that are out there, and then they send like up to 8,000 posts a month, and they're posting news articles um, to try to push things. I know in America, the number one target was black Americans because they're a significant voting bloc. And that's what they used in 2016 was special Russian designed ads to cause black Americans to not vote, um, I think is the main message. They probably also wanted them to vote for Trump, but I think that not even 1% of the black vote went to Trump. I think the only thing they were able to do is convince them not to vote, yeah. that's, which is pretty successful. But anyway, the, um, uh, but they're, they're watching how they do it, new techniques in, in uh, Africa, and that'll probably show what they're going to be doing here and probably going to start pretty soon if they haven't already started. Um, and so Twitter will probably be a lot less effective here, although Twitter's just going to stop carrying paid political ads. This kind of thing would still get through because this stuff masquerades as like real news stories. But anyway, um, so the FBI has issued a warning that multi-factor authentication is being defeated and many companies trust it. And if you come in with two-factor, they give you high privileges and they're saying you shouldn't because of course there are a bunch of attacks like SIM jacking to take over your phone. And once I take over your phone, I can get the SMS messages and that defeats most two factor authentication. So what they're saying is um, SMS based two factor or phone app based two factor is not enough. You should really include biometrics like a fingerprint or something. If you want to actually have high confidence that you're getting the right people. So that's interesting. And um, this one is another sign of what happens at Facebook. I mean, Facebook is like the U.S. federal government now. It's got a leader at the top who is just capricious, who just issues dictates apparently thoughtlessly, and they don't really go through any, like, process to make sure it makes any sense. So the NSO group is an Israeli hacking company, and they hacked into WhatsApp, and they sold this information to government agencies and law enforcement agencies which is the same thing Celebrite does. A lot of people do this. They're basically weapons contractors. They sell cyber weapons to governments who then use it to perform targeted attacks against criminals and people they don't like. But Facebook got very mad about this. So they um, sued NSO and said it was illegal what they're doing. And I really don't understand how they're going to do that since they're based in another country. But anyway, they are doing that. And then they went and, and deleted all the NSO staff Facebook accounts just to punish them. And this is what Zuckerberg has done before. Another thing Zuckerberg used to do in the early days of Facebook is he went to the Facebook failed logins so he could get everybody's password. 
In fact, there's a trick. You just configure it to reject the password the first three times, and everybody will try their other passwords. So he did that to journalists who were writing articles about Facebook to get their password, and then he logged into their emails to watch their discussion with their sources and decide what kind of articles they were going to write about Facebook. And he admitted this openly, was never prosecuted for it. But I mean, it's uh, this is why, you know, Libra is failing. It is a well-known Open secret, and not a secret at all. Everybody hates Facebook the way they all used to hate the phone company. Facebook is just fantastically unethical. Uh, Microsoft used to be hated like this 20 years ago. Before Windows uh, XP and the breakup, Microsoft did stuff like this all the time. Just extort companies. Like you had to carry, you couldn't carry any Linux product in a store. And if you did, Microsoft would take all their products out of your store. So like pressure you into pushing their stuff. And so everybody hated them. And Facebook is like this, just just sleazy and unethical and everybody's pretty fed up with them. So anyway, but they have record profits to report. So they're doing fine as far as money goes, even though everybody's pretty mad at them. It isn't holding them back. So this, uh, the lecture today is another topic that's not in the book. I'm very happy about this. I spent the last couple of weeks working on some new topics and I've got them going. I'm pretty happy with them. So the two topics here are web templates and .NET. And I've got a lecture and some cahoots and three new projects to do about that. They're all extra credit but I think it's very good stuff. I'm pretty excited about this because I have received a lot of criticism from my website, which is quite justified. My website looks like a 1995 website because I stopped learning anything about the web. In 95, in the last 20 years, I haven't paid any attention to it. And now I'm finally taking a look at it. So um, if you talk about websites, this is the kind of website that I make. This is the original use of the web. Now, it started with like FTP, where you would just connect to a server and download files. And the smallest step forward from FTP is HTTP, where you just send a GET request to the server and you get an HTML page or an image, and that's all I use. I write this stuff in just a text editor, and that's the way the web was in like the 1990s. And that was, <coughs> so the result of this is you get an old fashioned website that just sits there, it doesn't have any personalized content. And the point is the structure of your website is exactly equal to the layout of the files on the server. So you have a protocol, you have a domain name that gets you to the server, and then there's a folder name. There's a folder on the server called 127, and there's a file in there called 127 underscore F19, and that's it. The URL is just the literal address, the server name, folder name, file name of where it is on the server. And this is the way networks used to be. You would have a real hardware router and a real hardware switch and the LAN was all the computers in one room. And if you went to another room, that was a different LAN and everybody figured out, of course, that that didn't make any sense. You really want to have a VLAN so you can put people in a virtual local area network and you don't really want to have physical hardware. You want to have virtual hardware and software defined networks. And in the same spirit, this is really out of date where the actual layout of the URLs to get to your pages is exactly equal to the real folder structure on a real hard disk somewhere. That's why this is so out of date. So to be flexible enough to handle things like your business merging and growing and more servers being involved, you really want to move from this direct physical layout of the files on a server to a virtual layout, which is more flexible than that. And that's what you get to a modern website like Amazon. If you go to Amazon, this is not an HTML file on a disk that is delivered to you, not at all. This is dynamically generated content that has a message here and then uh, your name up there in the corner and another name down here. This is dynamically generated. No human wrote this HTML. A software delivered this HTML to your browser and it created your cookies and details from the URL and databases and everything and built this out of many components and that's the way you do it these days. So the way this works, that's a web app. And so you have a lot more than just get requests. You have post requests that are sending data up to the server for logging in and setting up credit cards. And you've got sessions and cookies to keep track of who you are in your past history. And then you have um, databases it's connecting to to find all this information. And you, of course, want it to scale to multiple servers and thousands of concurrent users. And all these things go way beyond the old fashioned website of the kind I make. So there's two basic technologies you need to do this, routing and templates. Um, since these advanced features require 
your request to be processed by a server-side script, the first question is how do you find the script? And that's what routing does. Routing takes your request and it takes parameters from the request and figures out which script on the server should handle your request. So if you go to foo.com slash bar, then one simple example would be to have some kind of configuration file where it just says when you have a bar there, go to the handle bar script. And you could just have a list of when you see this keyword, go to this script. When you see this keyword, go to that script. And you could write that in some language like Python or PHP or something, and that would be one way to do it. But of course, we're well beyond this custom stuff. Now we use frameworks. So here's how Django uses it, one of the popular frameworks. You have a configuration file, and it has a regular expression. So the caret means it starts with something starts with users, and then has a parameter called ID. Then it will call the display user ID script, and it will now have the name of the user and the name of the ID to customize what you get. And so you write script like that to do it. And here's Flask. Flask is a container protocol that makes it possible to take all the files that make your website and specify them. And as you can see, it has a similar thing here. It has a keyword at route. And in there is a sort of template. And then it knows to call this other script and pass the ID up to it. So that's what it looks like in Flask. Here's what it looks like in ASP.NET which is Microsoft's offering. You have the same kind of thing. You have an app user routes, and then you have routes, map route, and then you have this controller equals home, action equals index, ID, question mark. And that means those parts of the URL, which used to be folder names and file names, are now interpreted as parameters that are passed off to scripts. And they, they tell it which script to go to and what parameters to pass up to that script. Um, so that's what happens. And so that's what routing is. Routing is somehow deciding where the script is on the server and what parameters to pass to it. And the next thing is to dynamically generate, you need templates. And so you will have not a HTML file, you will have a template, which, in, which is like a form letter that includes insert username here, insert product name here, insert search results here. They'll have placeholders, which are then filled in by scripts. So here's Flask and Jinja 2 are the two um, technologies used here and so your flask app actually has a series of files in different folders and you have um, your app is defined as the flask of these things which explains how all these things are used and it finds these templates and uses the templates to deliver the page so you have these control characters in there in Jinja 2 it's curly braces and curly brace percents or four statements and double curly braces are things like usernames and there's other ones for comments and line statements. So there's a format. We're going to play a lot with this later. So uh, here you write a file like this and you'd have an HTML file and then in the middle you have curly brace username. So that is filled in from the, uh, by the Jinja framework with the username that it got from the URL or passed in as a parameter. So that's what you have for websites. And you can do the same thing, of course, in ASP.NET. Have the same kind of thing. You have a, a tree structured directory with templates in it, and there are JSON files and config files, and they look kind of like this. This is the template JSON. You have all these parameters, which are going to be passed up and used to fill in data on a page. And then you have a template. So here's the XML file that specifies the templates, which tells you where to go find templates. So that's what you have. You have these parameters which do it. And so there's two kinds of scripting. There is front end, which determines how things look. And that is generally a script that runs in your browser. So it's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Those determine what you see. And then there's the back end, which is all the how it works, the database with passwords, credit card numbers, and that's written in Ruby, Python, PHP, Java. Those are the scripts at the other end. And one huge security problem is that those scripts almost always contain secrets, like passwords and API keys, and developers usually think that customers cannot see the source code of the script, but frequently they can, because there's a series of mistakes you can make to where a script is misinterpreted as a static file and served up to the browser, and of course these days people will just take your code and put it on GitHub or something, so the scripts are there and developers often don't know that. So there's a variety of problems caused by the customer, but the original intention is that those scripts on the server are not directly available to the user. They're just supposed to be able to use the scripts by passing up parameters and then seeing the result. They're not actually supposed to see or modify the scripts themselves, but the vulnerabilities rely on either finding secrets in the script with information disclosure or finding ways to put content which is misunderstood by the script and gives you code execution, which is very common. 
and that's what we're going to do. So there are a lot of frameworks, and I went and found just some blog with a current list of the top 10 frameworks. So Angular, this is the front-end framework to make things look good. Angular, Ember, Flutter, React, and Vue are common ones. I've certainly heard of Angular. Of Angular, I found the same thing they found. It's sort of frustrating and hard to learn. But these are all have their these are all big and popular, and these are all to make it look pretty to the user. They run at your end. That's why I, I saw a, a register article about this about five years ago. Really surprised me to say, if you're really a hot programmer, the thing you need to know now is JavaScript. All these things running JavaScript, and this is because of um, Chrome and Mozilla. About 10 years ago, JavaScript was so slow that nobody did anything significant with it at all. And Chrome and Mozilla got fed up with this. And they said, you know, the JavaScript engine in Internet Explorer is just garbage. And they made it a better engine that was 100 times faster. So suddenly you could do really complicated things in JavaScript and it moved. And so for a while, you couldn't do any of this with Internet Explorer. You could only do it with Chrome and Mozilla. And they developed all these the early prototypes of these fancy frameworks. And those pages looked much better. And then Microsoft caught up, and now everybody's used to having a lot of complicated JavaScript in your pages that runs fast. And on the back end, you can have these things like Django, Ruby on Rails, Symfony, and these others. And these all have, there's all scripts that are the developer put on the website that generate the content. So you become a specialist in one of the other of these frameworks and use them. That's typically what happens. And here's a blog with the top framework technologies. PHP is big. ASP is really big. Ruby on Rails and Java and Python are smaller. And on you go. Node.js is up there. These are the modern language you use to make modern websites. And since it's the early days of these things, they are really buggy and full of security problems. And there are some pretty hilarious security problems. And that's what I'm going to show you is the server-side template injection. This is good, clean fun. Um, but let me, let me just bring this up because I think I can demonstrate a little of it without too much struggle. Um, this is ED105, which is this one. All right. And so what's going on here, you can make your own, by just with a few commands on Ubuntu, you can make your own demonstration of this using Docker. And if you haven't used Docker, Docker is awesome. The whole point of Docker, it's like a virtual machine. It has the, all the software in this little container runs in your thing, so you can just install Docker here, app to update, app to install, and once you've got Docker running, which it runs nicely on Linux, you can then just pull anything in the Docker repository, like GitHub. They have a free online repository where you can put up Docker images that are like virtual machines, but they're much smaller and much faster. And so you pull down this thing called SSTIN, which is a demonstration app, which is a deliberately vulnerable web application. And all you have to do is run it. And this minus P means you will map the Docker. In, the, when Docker machines run up, they have their own IP address. And you, they can't send data in from the outside unless you map a port. So this maps port 60 inside the container to port 60 outside the container. So the end result is when you do that, it's running. And now it's listening on port 60. So your Google Cloud machine will now be listening on 60. And you can you, now, of course, you cannot get any traffic in from the outside unless you let it through the Google Cloud firewall, which blocks all traffic. So you have to go here and create a port allowing in port 60. And once you do that, you'll be able to open it in a browser by just going to the public IP address of your machine, and you will then see a page like this. And I'm not going to bother setting it up in my Linux machine because I'll use my public one for the demonstration. But now we can play some games with it. So let me bring up the public one, which is coming down here at the end. Let me get it. Um, it is this one. Okay. All right. So here's my public uh, image of the same thing. And I'm going to just try and lay out my screen a little better. All right. So um, there we are. This is what I was going to do. First thing I'm going to do is fingerprinting. So if I put in, you can search for things here. If I put in Sam, it's just going to say, user Sam exists. Now, it doesn't really have a database. It always tells you this user exists. So it's a very simple app. And the only point is it repeats whatever I put in here. And if I put in normal text, the normal text comes back. But if I put in a template injection like this one, 2 plus 2, or that's 2 times 2, inside double curly braces, it accepts that as a command, not as a fixed text. And so if I search for that, 
I get user four. So it evaluated two times two to be four. So I have command injection. I am able to inject a command and it executes. Now, the only, this is just like SQL injection. I can inject a command, but the problem is, like SQL injection, I'm injecting it in some screwy language. I'm injecting it in Django templates or Jinja2 template language, which is not a, like I was able to inject bash command line, but I can inject something. So now you have to fingerprint your server, and here's a flowchart designed by a hacker. You try these things, seven times seven, and if it does execute the code, then you follow the green line, and if it doesn't, you follow the red line, and then you try this one and this one, and you can now find out which template is used, and this will find four popular templates, engines, Twig, Jinja2, Mako, and Smarty. And so you start with seven times seven, dollars and only single quotation marks. So you inject that one, and it does not execute. It just echoes back the way it is. So that is a false response. So you follow the red line. Since this one did not execute, I try this one. Double quote seven star seven. So let's try that one. It is double curly braces, seven star seven. And that one does execute and give me 49. So I follow the green arrow. Now I'm to this one, which is seven star quote seven quote. And so when you do that one, it's going to succeed also, and you'll end up, of course, this is in fast ginger too. So that's the game there. All right. And so um, that's the first flag is the thing you'll get there. And so the next thing is, um, now you can talk about Python inheritance. And this is really quite interesting. So let me uh, bring up a live code to show you this. I'm just going to go to a Debian machine here. And let's get rid of this one. All right, and you can use, I can even use the Mac, you can use anything that has Python 3. And what you're really learning here is the structure of Python 3, because what we have to do, now we can execute some commands on the server, but we can only execute a very small limited set of commands. But on a Python 3 server, you can get arbitrary code execution because of the object inheritance of Python. And that's what we're gonna go through here. So if I go here, and uh, I think I want this one. There we are. All right. And that one. All right. Let's get rid of this. Um, that. All right. All right. So now um, I'm just trying to arrange junk on my screen. So there we are. Now I can go back and forth really. So I go Python 3. Okay. It tells me I'm running Python 3.5.3. That's fine. So now I'm going to do this stuff. Okay. So I define a string. Oh, something bad happened. Okay. There. All right. So I define a string equals to hello. That's an S object. Now in Python, you can use dir to see the contents of an object. Everything is an object in Python and objects and object oriented programming language, languages have attributes and methods. Attributes are data stored in the object, and methods are functions in the object. So here you, it has something called add and format and get attribute, and then find and is identifier, is lowered, is numeric, and upper here. These are things you can do with a string in Python. For, so you can, um, for example, you can do s lower. That will just change it to lowercase. I define it as a capital hello but the lower method turns it into lowercase. And that you get for free. You don't have to define that. If you have a string, Python 3 gives you those functions attached to the string object. And it inherits it from the template of what string object should be. Okay, that's fine. But now you can go to class, underscore, underscore, class, underscore, underscore, and that will tell you what type of object is this thing called S, which is hello. And it is a string. So that's how you find out what it is. So that's fine. All right, and if you run s lower this way, it will just tell you it is a method lower, but if you put it in the parentheses, it will then run the method lower and give you the results. Because the lower is a function, and the function lives somewhere. It's a method of the string object, and it lives somewhere in memory at an address. So this is getting an idea of how it all works, and this is really important, and I've seen this in a lot of CTFs. You can get away with murder in Python 3 by understanding how the objects are tied together. So, now we can walk up the hierarchy. So we found this thing called S class here. And that told us that it's a string. So we could do S class and then do the class of that. 
And now we'd find it's a type. So the string, S is a string, and the, the class of string is a type. A type is the container above the string. So that's fine. So I, I have a string called hello, and the, the parent of that is a class called string, and the parent of that is a class called type. And type is one of the roots of the Python object hierarchy, but there's another one called object. And to get over there, I have to do base instead of class. So if the second one I do is base, now I'm over to object. So what this means is I was able to take an object like a string and I was able to go to a parent and the parent again and get up to the root of the whole system. So now that I got to the root of the whole system, I could come down and get to something else. And I want to get to this method, OS system, which executes command line code. So I can take something innocent like a string and I can walk through the object structure and get to command execution. It's bloody awesome. <laughs> What's, yeah, what's that? So you jump to a different class? Yes, you go to the parent and the parent of that, and then you come down a different track. So it's bloody awesome just by having long, just like SQL injection. Remember, you just had to have these long strings, and you could take this screwy SQL language that was only supposed to do one thing and make it do something terrible. And you can take this that's just supposed to let you manipulate a string by like changing it to uppercase, and you can abuse it to do arbitrary code injection. That's how it works. So um, here's how you do it. So I need to walk down the hierarchy. Now I've made it up to the root of the whole system. So to walk down the hierarchy, um, here's how I do it. I'm gonna import OS and subclass to get the stuff to make this easy. And now I'm gonna look at class base. That takes me to the root of the whole system. And now I'm gonna look at the subclasses of the object. And the subclasses of the object object are really big because this is, of course, the root of the whole Python structure, and it has many, many methods and attributes. But I can do any of them by just injecting junk. So I just have to find the path that will get me where I want to be. And so if I do class-based subclasses, and then I do the length of it, you see there are 185 attributes and methods available <laughs> from the object. So you can list them all, and you can find out what they all do. And so the one I'm gonna find is catch warnings because catch warnings has um, import. So I can actually import libraries with a sub message of catch warnings. So this is gonna run a loop in Python. It's going to get the, um, okay, I wanna get set up for this. I wanna have this thing, I'm gonna make, to save typing, I'm gonna make this thing called C which is the object. I started with a string. I went to the class and the base, and now the subclasses of it. So this is the, I'm gonna call that C, so I don't have to type all this junk all the time. So that's C, and there are 185 objects in C. That is this list of junk I just printed out. Now I wanna search through that list to find the thing that does, that prints warnings. So that's what this does. This is simple Python script that's very much like what you'd see in Python 2. I go through the whole thing, all 185 of them. I then take the name of each of those objects and see if it has warning in it. And if it finds the string warning, then this result will be the location of that string, which will be zero or a bigger number, should be greater than minus one, and then it will print out which one it is. So when I run that, it finds it's 62 catch warnings. Now notice that my instructions had 80. You will get a different number every time because the order of these methods is not fixed. So this is one of the things you have to do when you're doing the exploit, you have to find out what that number is. Unless you want to have really complicated exploits to keep hunting for it all the time, which is another option. So now that I know that it's 62, I can now save myself time by making something called x equals c sub 62. And now if I do x underscore name, That'll be catch warning. So I've now found the catch warnings um, function from objects. Now, the reason I wanted this function is because this function can do um, import, which is just mind boggling. So if I look at the built in functions here, I have this long list of junk, and one of these is underscore underscore import in that long mess. And we can find it with, again, a um, a simple list 
Um, if I go here and I call that B, the built-ins, and get the length of it, and then show the class, I will see that this is a dictionary with 151 entries, the functions there, and I can find import the same way. I can go through all the things in B and see if they have import in them, and I will find that it's in there, built-in function import. So I've gone up, over, down, and now I can go down again, and now I can call import. So I can import libraries into Python 3 that the developer did not put in there, which is just mind boggling You could use not only any function the developer used, but you can import libraries the developer did not import. <laughs> so now I've got what I need. I need to go here and import OS. And once I've done the import, and I have OS, I can now execute system which will let me execute bash command line commands like date. Because OS system is the Python command that just executes bash. So I'm now going to execute date. And there it is. That is date. And so now you've got the typical kind of command injection we talked about. I could do um, ls. And I'll get a list of files. I could do, you know, ls minus l. And I'm getting the whole printout of uh, the time and everything. You know, this is just like all the other command ejections you've done in this class. You have this ridiculous long string before that, and then over here at the end, you've got a place where you can just put in bash commands. You can only do one command at a time, though. Doing multiple commands is too annoying in this situation. But still, one command at a time is enough. And uh, you can now do anything you want, so I gave you some challenges here. Now you go into mine walk up the hierarchy, walk down, and there's some challenges here. There's flags on my server, <laughs> and you have to go find them, uh, and it's good, clean fun. So that's the joy of server-side template injection. This became well-known in 2015. The guys that wrote Burp, of course, the experts and stuff, wrote a blog about it, everybody found out, and I, the only re I found out about two weeks ago there was a single tweet on Twitter, and the guy said, this is my server-side template injection that will give you a reverse shell in Jinja 2. And I looked at that and I said, I don't understand a word of that. Let me check it out. And I Googled a few times and I said, holy cow, this is like the new hotness and there's relatively easy proof of concept. And so this has to be in the course. So there you go. Yes. Yeah, there's, the, all the stuff we did here is intrinsic to Python 3. I don't think you could do any of this in Python 2. Although I haven't, of course, nobody cares. Python 2 is on the way out. But all this stuff runs on Python 3. Yeah, but there are other um, but there are other template injection languages, and they have similar vulnerabilities. And I think they're not all based on Python. But um, there are, and this is people are trading their exploits. You could, I do, I'm satisfied with just executing a single command. But of course, what's cooler is to get a reverse shell, and you can do that. There are various ways to make long commands that will use SSTI to get a reverse shell. So, and just like people. In SQL injection, especially when it was new, everybody was coming up with more ways to do cool things for SQL injection. Get a reverse shell, deface the server. Uh, and so they were making blogs and posts, and people are doing that now with SSTI. They are finding all these cool SSTI exploits. And just like SQL injection exploits, they tend to be really long and complicated. And the people are challenging to think of the cleverest and shortest and most general way to do it. And it all depends on the exact version of everything they're running. So um, anyway. But this is, yeah. Yeah. I think it happens in Ruby and other ones. I think they all have similar vulnerabilities. So this is why um, whenever you take data from the user, you should be removing the special characters, which are used to make meta characters. That's the, that's the general recommendation. But there's always somebody that doesn't. And that's how you get all these injections. Just like you should take the apostrophes out of SQL injection and so on. You should take the curly braces out of Django or whatever this Jinja stuff, but many developers don't know that and there are going to be commercial products and open source products that don't think of this and uh, It's the early days. So there'll probably be a lot of like red letter vulnerabilities Anyway, that's the joy of that stuff and I got some cahoots about that and then I got another Related topic. So let me find my cahoots for this one and uh, There's my cahoots so it's Favorites. Okay. Yes, SSTI is relatively new. Like I said, it was only 
published in like 2015. So it's maybe three or four years. It's the first time I ever learned about it. So, you know, it's, it's not absolutely new cutting edge, but it's pretty new. What's that? SSTI, yeah, server-side template injection. That's what this stuff is. You have these template languages and you inject into it uh, like SQL injection. And I saw a chat message come in. Canary enabled Fortify. I'm doing a pwn challenge with Canary. Um, I'm not generally here on Saturday, but Liz will be here and I, uh, I see this looks like Windows defenses. Um, I might be around Saturday. Uh, contact me on Twitter. It's a good question. This looks pretty interesting. I might be here Saturday. Oh yeah, 64-bit return. Yeah, it looks like good frame. This is the Microsoft defenses, relative Chrome and PI. Or it could be, um, they could be Linux defenses. Oh yeah, yeah, that looks like a good one. Yeah, let's talk about it on Saturday. I'll, I'll, I'll probably be around. Tweet me if you don't see me. Good. Anyway, um, this is CNET 127 and 1030. And uh, All right. And this should be... Okay. So maybe we got enough people. I'm thinking we do. I'll give it another five seconds. What's that? You still get... You still coming in? No, not today was holiday. Oh no, tomorrow's holiday. Yeah. All right. Brexit day, or maybe not. Anyway, so. All right. Which one is a popular front end framework? Angular is the one there. One I use is HTML, but that's not even a framework. That's for Wimps. All right, so. All right, what component dynamically generates the HTML? Okay, that's templates, that's what they do. It, your page is like a form letter with fields that are filled in from data, it gets here and there. All right, so what requests do not require any server-side scripts? That should be server. That's a get request. Get just fetch a file from the server. You can, in principle, send them to scripts and put parameters in them, but normally they're just getting a file that's just sitting on the server and they don't need to be run by a script. They just go straight to the web server like Apache and it just finds the file and hands it out to you. All right. Hey, Sammy Mad. Good. Okay. Anyway. Right. Um, okay. Which one will find the correct script to handle a request? Okay, and that's called routing. Good. So we've got some winners, which is, is that you, Kay? Sam? That's me. That's you? Good. Okay. Good. And Ken is a real name. And Anton is a real name. Good. All right. All right. So I... I think I'll just go ahead with the next one. It's a completely different topic. Um, so now, it, it's related though. If you talk about, that was web apps, the process web request. Now you might want to write desktop or mobile apps. So you can have native code or byte code. Native code is what we've been doing, where you'd write something like C or C++, and you compile it with something like GCC, and then you'd get a uh, machine language for x64 or x86 and then if you want to analyze the machine language you have to use something like ida pro that will show you this kind of assembly language which is created from the machine language that's what we've been doing in this class primarily is looking at that kind of code but if you want to have 
things that are for enterprise class scale, not to run on just one machine or phone, then you typically go to one of these. You go either to Java or .NET. Java, the purpose of Java is to scale to big applications that go across many servers and you also to create apps that are platform independent. You can run them on Linux or Windows or the Mac um, because the code is not assembly code. It's not, it's not machine language for a processor. It is byte code which runs in a Java virtual machine. And you put a Java virtual machine on whatever platform you have and that runs in real machine language and the Java app runs in the virtual machine. So it's only sort of half compiled down to a platform independent bytecode. And Microsoft, I guess, wanted to compete with Java because they made their version of essentially the same thing, which is ASP.NET. And .NET lets you write any of about 10 or 12 languages. The most common are C Sharp and Visual Basic. And then you run the common language runtime and it turns it again into partially compiled stuff called intermediate language, which then runs on the a CLR, just-in-time compiler, which is essentially the Microsoft version of the Java virtual machine that compiles it line by line. Now, the original intention, like many Microsoft products, mm -hmm. was that this would be on other platforms like Linux and stuff, but nobody cared, and in fact, it only runs on Windows. So, um, your Java source code would look like this in a high level language, you know, looks sort of like C or something. And when you compile it, it'll turn into bytecode. And the bytecode looks like this go to 38, you know, this increment one, go to 11, this sort of thing. These little tiny uh, primitive operations. That's what the bytecode looks like. And if you go to C sharp in .NET, you'll have things like this a function if the text is top secret, show win, else show fail. And when you compile it with .NET, it'll turn into intermediate language. And intermediate language looks like this with store location and call virtual function and so on. These little operations which are like assembly language, but it's a little different. That's the uh, intermediate language between high level language like C Sharp and the x86 assembly code that's underneath, it, uh, machine code that's underneath it. So that's the game. And so here's, um, information about them. So Microsoft.net can do C Sharp, Visual Basic, C++, PHP, Ruby, Python, and others, like dozens of them. Java has a bunch of related things like PHP, Ruby, Python, and Scala. It runs on many languages for Java, but the Microsoft version is, of course, only Windows. The, the Java virtual machine runs this stuff, but this thing is called the command line runtime or environment or something like that. Um, I forget the name. It's up here someplace. There. Common language runtime, that's the Microsoft equivalent. So you've got .NET here and .NET classes, and uh, you have the web server scripting is ASP.NET. So you have ASP for active server pages, is Microsoft scripting language that goes with this, and you can put web apps in this framework, and you can put mobile apps and desktop apps all in the same framework, and you put, write them all in Visual Basic, of course, in, in Microsoft's Visual Studio. Anyway, so here's the game. You choose Java for enterprise class applications with high volume so they can scale across many servers. And you use .NET if you want to have this Visual Studio. Rich Gui, that's what developers love Visual Studio. And this helps me understand something that happened last semester that made me crazy is um, someone made a version of Penguin, was a version of Linux to run on Windows for Windows developers. And what they do is they get so used to, they love Visual Studio. They love this Microsoft environment so much that they want to write Bash scripts and Linux code in Visual Studio. So they want a version of Linux that runs inside Windows so they can keep using all these Microsoft tools. Because if you're a heavily Microsoft Windows oriented chop, you get used to the luxury of these GUI environments and everything. And you don't ever want to use like command line Linux or anything awful like that. So that's, this is developers get used to this stuff and they want everything to be inside Windows. So that's what happens there. Anyway. Um, from Anton. I remember Sun sued Microsoft because they used Java without payment. I know they sued um, Google for that because they used Java in the Android phones, but they may have sued Microsoft too. Yeah, Microsoft invented their own language based on Java in order to not pay. Yes, absolutely. Kotlin compiles also. I don't know about Kotlin. Anyway, this is very interesting. If you guys have a uh, Things to add, feel free, because I certainly am a noob to all this stuff. I've just learned how to do a few fun things with it. So I wrote a couple of projects. Here you make a .NET app, 
and here you hack into a .NET app. And this is extremely easy, much easier than using IDA Pro and getting into native code is to hack into .NET apps. So let me just point you to these projects. I think I won't do them live, but I'll point, you know, go through what they look like. I don't think it's necessarily productive to go through them live. Let's get to my correct browser. Okay, so here we are. Um, so let me see if I can somehow dig down to my browser. Um, let's get rid of that one. There we are. So here's the first one, 330, where you do it. So you get a Windows machine. You can use a Google Cloud Windows machine, of course. And um, so you have install Visual Studio 2019, the same old way you've done it before. And now you can make Hello World. It's a template that comes right here, and you can choose uh, to make a console app or a, um, a, and here we're going to make a console app with .NET Core. And so that's Hello World, and it will write the code for you. So it just has console write line Hello World. And then it has some uh, junk outside that it's all boilerplate. So when you run that, it will print Hello World in a terminal. So that's pretty boring. Now you can do string applications. You can put a, you can go in here and change this code and make it print something a little different, like you said something. And now um, you can actually make a buffer overflow. Now Microsoft has tried to prevent typical C type buffer overflows. So if you try to do the usual thing here, where you define a character with only room for 10 characters, and then you read something that might be longer than 10, then it will try to prevent you from doing that, and you have to actually go into properties and check this box to allow unsafe code. By default, they won't let you overflow things anymore. But you can turn on the old-fashioned compiling where it allows unsafe code, and then you can actually create a crash. It'll actually crash for you just like the others with a buffer overflow. So it's possible, although Microsoft has made it inconvenient and difficult to have this kind of buffer overflow in modern apps. So that's one thing you can do. Now you can make a GUI project. Go down to a forms project, not a console project, and here you get the power of Visual Studio, why everybody likes it. You just see a form here, just sitting there, and you code, not by writing code, but by just dragging things in. You have a toolbar. So you drag in a button, you drag in a field, you drag in a label and just set them on the screen, and it will write the code for you. So you, put, you can view it in this view and see the app ready to go in the graphics, or you can go view the code, and when you view the code, you'll see that it's created a button, and here's the button, and now you can add some code. So here I can just put in, if the text is top secret, show win, otherwise show fail. I can add just a few lines of code to all the boilerplate code that Visual Studio put in there, and now I have something that asks you for a password, and if you put in the wrong password, you get fail, and if you put in the right password, you get win. So, you know, you can make the equivalent of those little games you've been hacking into, here, and you can see why everybody loves it. You don't have to write much code. You can see it in the GUI and everything. So you can compile this thing, and now you can uh, do some challenges to prove that you've done it. So that is forward developing with .NET. Of course, we're doing very simple developing. We're not really learning much that a real developer would need, but you're learning the basics, because the main thing for us is hacking it. And there are a bunch of hacking tools just for .NET. And the one we're going to use is one called .NET Reflector, which is a commercial product, but you get a 45-day free trial. So here's the form, the same one you made before. And if you want to um, do this, you just put in Reflector, and then you run .NET Reflector. And this is what .NET Reflector looks like. You load the app in Reflector, and it will just have a tree-structured uh, list of what's in the app here. And you can dig through the hierarchy until you get to the button. And when you click on the button, you can see the source code. It takes the .NET intermediate language and it decompiles it back into source code and you can put that source code in any language you want. C-sharp, even though the developer wrote it in C-sharp, you can view source code in Visual Basic if you like, because it doesn't matter. And so here you can see right there what's going on. If it equals top secret, show win, else pro fail. So you can see how it works. You can also view the intermediate language here. On the same button, this is the actual content of the .NET app. It is this junk, and notice how the different instructions take a different number of bytes. So here's these are only one byte instructions. This one looks like a four or five byte instruction. You get down to seven, then you get down to C, it's a longer one. So you have these various instructions, and these are just moving things in and out of registers, sort of like uh, assembly language we've seen elsewhere. So now 
you can modify this app in a hex editor, just like we did with um, that app. Uh, we did Putty. Remember, you took Putty, put it in Ida Pro or a disassembler, found the thing to change, and then we went into a hex editor and just modified it. You can totally modify this. You can find the these intermediate language things have hex codes. And you can find a whole list of them here of all the hex codes, but here's the hex codes for this stuff. So store location zero is zero A, this is zero six. Break false is two C, and this is a short break. So this is a branch false. So if the condition is false, it will take a jump. So two C is the opcode for branch false. And this is the number of bytes to jump, which might vary. And here's load string win. This is load string. And the next four bytes are that win exclamation point. So these parts are a little hard. Anyway, the point is now I can look for this pattern. You can open the .NET at executable in a hex viewer, and you can find those strings. So I'm looking for this pattern, 0A062C, then something I don't know, and that is 72. So I can search for 0A062C, and there's the 72. So I have found the right place that does that. And now, if I want to make this game easier, remember we cheated on some executable games. You're going to cheat on the game. The point of this is it's going to compare to see if you have the right thing here. If false. So if I change this break false to break true, then any password that is wrong will win instead of any password that's right win. So that would be a sufficient to make the game easy to win, would be to change break false to break true. And all you have to do for that is change the 2C to a 2D. 2C is branch false, 2D is branch true. So you just have to find the correct 2C and change it to 2D and save that file. And now when you run it and you put in the wrong password, you win. So this is the .NET version of the simple things we did with x86 and x64 code. So that's the game. And uh, now you've got um, a file to modify. And you've got another file to hack into and do reverse engineering. So that's the joy of .NET reversing. It's very easy. This is like if you take the mobile device hacking class, we do a lot of Android reversing. And Android is the same because it's Java bytecode. You can totally read it. You can modify it. It is in crazy. You can go to the top apps like the Bank of America. You can totally modify the app and make it steal the credit card numbers or anything. And I told Bank of America, and they just don't even care. But their app is just wide open. And Android apps come to you with this bytecode, which you can read just like source code. It's Bloody crazy, and a lot of apps have secrets in there, and you can just see them. Yeah, yeah. Um, since you said Bank of America still haven't fixed it, they don't care. Isn't it some kind of violation of the PCI? Well, you know, I would like I would like to think so, but apparently not. The PCI has like twenty things you have to do, and they talk about where you store the data and how you transmit the data. I don't think they discuss how you write your apps, and they're. The app does not transmit data unencrypted over the internet. The app can be modified, but they can say that's not their problem. Somebody else modified my app. Now, other places like the National Football League, if you modify their app, the first thing it does when you launch the app is it checks the signature. And if the app has been modified, it won't do anything. It pops up a box and says, your app is out of date. You must update the app before you continue. But the Bank of America just can't be bothered to do that. It's... Yeah, I don't think they're, apparently they're not legally required to. I had the opinion they should do it, and I talked to all the banks and tried to get them to do it, and they all just laughed at me and didn't do it. But anyway, yeah. I think you're just too small, man. Well, that could... SEC. Well, but that, that, well, that's one way to look at it. You could say that the point is, like I say, they have not passed a law requiring it. That's it. And just the fact that I don't like it doesn't matter. The only thing that would do it is if there is a law passed requiring it, or if some large number of people are really losing money from it. The fact is, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the issue. But of course, another way to say it is, of course, it's not important. There is not a huge number of people losing money in America because of fake apps. I think they are in other countries like India and China. I think people are losing a lot of money from fake apps. In America, it's not a major threat value. So I, I think that's the issue. Anyway. For whatever reason, they don't fix it, but it does make good, clean fun for us. We can totally play with commercial apps and mess with them. And this is very similar. Yeah. So, another question. Like the NFL app, it's like they check the signature. You found any other apps besides the NFL app that does that? Yeah, uh, the one, it's in that class. We'll do it. Yeah, the M Adhar app, which is the main one in India, the ID card app. That actually has quite a few security measures on it, and it's fun to get around them. 
and the uh, French hacker showed, really showed how to get around them, and I wrote some projects doing that. It actually detects if your phone is, is rooted and it won't run, and it actually checks to see that it has been modified and then it won't run, and you can find the code and turn those off, of course. And that's why some people say it's not even worth doing, because in principle, you could turn off those checks, but in fact, it's like any other security measure. If you put in a barrier, it'll stop the weaker attackers and only a smarter attacker will get through. So anyway, so that's, that's the new topic, and, and you should check out the joy of .NET. And let me see if there's any more chat messages or anything. Um, yeah, here they are. Uh, yeah, so hey, Kotlin was uh, Google's answer to Java. Okay, that's good. another one. There's many other platforms. This is not an exhaustive list at all. Um, there's many other ways to do these things all over the place. But these are some of the big ones, and I'm just getting into a little bit more of modern web hacking. So I think I'm going to shut down the Zoom. Uh, I'll stick around for a while to help people if they want help on projects. But that's enough of a lecture for this. Have a good night, folks.